Welcome to all the uh, colleagues uh, here and joining us uh, to Zoom and special welcome uh, to my uh, friend uh, Magda and his team from the uh, IFC. Uh, as uh, our uh, head of communication told you, dear colleagues, we are here to share with you some of the findings of the IEA IFC joint analysis on uh, how to scale up private financing for clean energy in emerging and developing uh, economies. For us, for the IEA, this is a, a crucial topic. And as I always say, uh, there are many, many challenges to reach our international climate goals. And if somebody uh, asks me to pick up the most important one, for me, this is the fault line of reaching international climate goals, namely financing clean energy in the emerging and developing world. This was a, a conversation between uh, Magda and myself at the end of uh, last uh, year. And we thought, why don't we bring the forces uh, together, our uh, strengths uh, together and come up uh, with uh, such a, a report. Because dear colleagues, uh, I believe in fact, more than I believe, the, our numbers show the, uh, the future of the uh, energy world and the climate uh, issues will be more and more decided in Delhi, Dhaka, uh, uh, Baghdad, uh, Jakarta, and elsewhere. So it is therefore very important uh, that we brought, back then myself, IES, uh, uh, our unparalleled energy data, our analytical uh, skills and our expertise in energy transition, together with IFC's a deep experience, real world experience in terms of the get the projects uh, moving. Dear colleagues, if I can try to uh, uh, frame the discussion and our work, we at the IEA, we look at the energy investment globally every year, how much money goes to pipelines, refineries, renewable energy, everything. And uh, this year, for example, the entire energy investment in the world is $2.7 trillion, 2.7. Out of this 2.7, $1 trillion goes to fossil fuels, 1.7, clean energy investments. So 1.7 clean and one uh, for uh, fossil fuels. And when we look at this Paris Agreement, clean energy investments is increasing gradually. This is a good news. The bad news is when we look at this increase, more than 90% of the increase since Paris 2015 to the, today in the clean energy comes from advanced economies and China. Only 10% of the increase uh, comes from uh, the emerging and developing uh, countries. As such, uh, we think that we need to change this trend, which is more or less flat uh, since eight years, clean energy investment in the emerging and uh, uh, developing world. And uh, uh, we know that there are some bright spots here and there. I was last week in India for the G20 uh, uh, meetings. In India, there's a solar issue. In Brazil, there is some renewal projects, but globally, it is really uh, not very uh, uh, promising. If I can share with you how much it is a problem not only for climate, but in general energy. One for me, very stark example, a couple of data. Today in Sub-Saharan Africa, one out of two person, they don't have electricity, one out of two. Second, 40% of the global solar radiation in the world comes to Sub-Saharan Africa, the richest region in the world. Third, Solar is the cheapest source of electricity generation in the entire world today, almost entire world, including Sub-Saharan Africa. Fourth, however, this is a stark problem. The amount of solar electricity or electricity from solar we generate entire Sub-Saharan Africa is less than solar electricity generated in Netherlands. But look at the thing about the, uh, the uh, map. How big is Africa? How big is Netherlands? 
how sunny is Africa, how sunny is Netherlands, and yet Netherlands generates more electricity from solar than sub-Saharan Africa. I think this is an uh, example that needs to be fixed for climate, but before climate, for uh, uh, energy uh, and economic uh, development. Our analysis show uh, that today in the emerging and developing countries, uh, clean energy investments are about $250 billion. $250 billion goes to clean energy investment in the emerging and developing world to be in line with the sustainable development goals, including reaching our climate goals, this need to be multiplied by a factor of seven. It should be close to two trillion uh, US uh, dollars. But when we look at it, how this money can be raised, our analysis show that this will be impossible, this money to be financed, raised by the public uh, resources uh, alone. So there is a need to get uh, private uh, capital. And our analysis here shows that the, about 60% of the finance for uh, the emerging and developing countries for clean energy needs to be financed from the uh, private sources. So there is a role for that. But uh, how will this happen? This will happen by taking some key measures and we have in our work uh, identified four different dimensions how the private sector money can flow in these countries and uh, it is uh, now uh, here my great pleasure to turn to my uh, friend my colleague Magda to take us through how we can uh, raise this uh, uh, money multiply the current 250 by a factor of uh, seven to be in line with our energy and uh, climate costs. Magda, uh, over to you, please. Thank you very much. It's a huge pleasure to be here with my friend Fatih. And I would like to read to, to commend him really for uh, his great contribution. AAE is a leading institution in the world in terms of analytical work uh, and policy advice in the energy sector. I know that I worked uh, on energy from the public sector side of the World Bank Group, and now as a private sector, we started our collaborations at time. And it was clear that uh, from the day one, we agreed that a uh, joining force would be the only solution to bring again. And uh, really uh, building on the very uh, high level of quality of analysis, which is coming from AIE, we can uh, uh, we ensure that bringing the private sector flavor on the MDB's flavor to the conversation, we'll be able to attract more investment. So as I've been said, uh, most of the investment go to most African economies more uh, China and very not enough go to, to low-income countries, particularly in Africa, has been uh, highlighted. We have here uh, now some challenges. I was uh, a month ago with uh, Adbella Joe discussing with institutional investors who are ready to put more money in this sector and they ask for a certain number of questions. And I think that some of those questions are, are, are largely addressed in the, in the report but let me highlight some of the questions. They don't, uh, they cannot appreciate properly the risk attached to investing in low-income countries. So they need to understand better the level of risk, be able to price better the investment. So the work of, in, of data that have been collected on, uh, by, by uh, IAEE is very important to be disseminated to the investors to be uh, themselves to understand better the economic information that is in those countries. The second one is the, is the information that we have as working in other sectors in those countries that are very important. For instance, we have teamed up with other partners to have what we call the GEMS, which is a database on the risk of profile of investment which are made in low-income countries so that it gives a better perception of the risk. Secondly, uh, institutional investors want to have a large amount of money to invest. When you talk to a, a, a fund manager for, for uh, uh, institutional investors, they don't want to invest $10 million here, $20 million here, $100 million there. They want billions to be able to go to their board and convince their board to take the deposit and the, and the contribution of the pensioner of their country to invest it in productive uh, a project. So we come to the second bottleneck, which is 
the number of bankable projects which are presented, and the diversity of geographic sources of these uh, projects so that they can de-risk their investment and have a portfolio investment which is diverse enough for them to, to control and to have a better understanding of, of the risk. But in spite of all this size and to be able to have a better understanding of the risk, they still consider that the risk is very high and therefore they need some money to de-risk. And that's also a conversation about blended finance, how we can leverage. So when Fatih Birol and I start talking about it a few years ago, we, uh, we, he was among those who really pushed to see how can we leverage the philanthropy money. All this money is just given there in the world on a grant basis, on an individual basis to countries. And but where we looked at it and we didn't feel that there was a leverage that was needed uh, of, uh, by using these resources. So the idea has been now to bring more of this philanthropic money, bring the bilateral money given by countries in terms of grant, but also the resources of MDBs. And all the conversations that will be, will be happening in the next two, three days in Paris is about that. If you want to summarize it, a big part will be about that. And that what we're doing right now in the energy sector is a little bit of a teaser of the conversations that we have at a broader level in a few days uh, when we will be launching the report. This is a summit called by President Macron. But in the meantime, we haven't been uh, uh, stay uh, inactive. There is a lot of instruments that have been developed in terms of a private capital mobilization. The market from green bond has been increasing. Uh, uh, this year, I cannot give you the numbers because I need another 10 days to provide us our final numbers in terms of commitments this year. But I can tell you already, it will be by far the highest increase in commitment in the year to year in the history of IFC. But where is, more importantly, is where is increase in commitment coming from. We have moved to 46% of our commitment in IFC on climate change related activities. And a lot of them are linked to the renewable energy agenda. So therefore we have seen a, 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 a structural transformation of the type of lending that the private sector and the DFIs are making on. Let me give you, uh, uh, to, to, to close, some of the instruments that we are using. We'll be using a, we are using a lot of bonds. Uh, we are more and more, the green bonds are very, becoming more and more popular among countries. We are working on the, using the taxonomy and the green taxonomy that has been developed with country to be able to make this market even larger and moving from being a national market to being a, re, a regional market. Therefore, if someone has a bond in one country, he could trade them in another uh, uh, place and vice versa, so that you can have a much uh, uh, larger capitalization of this market. The second is to link uh, 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 a green uh, energy transition to social inclusion. Uh, Fatih was mentioning earlier a uh, country like Indonesia and others. This transition will require also to take into account so social elements. And that's why we have been, in addition to the green bonds having social bond and socially inclusive and sustainable bond to take into account all that is necessary to be done. Third, the reports of IEA have a series of reports that I personally read uh, uh, religiously about the technology evolution. And we have a good story around solar, which show that when we have this big push together with the private sector investing more in a, in a, in a technology, the cost of curve go down very quickly, and that's the story of solar today, which is a, 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 a much, much cheaper and accessible to developing countries. So how to have the same movement on very mature technology, which are uh, 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 available, and FATI has been pushing very much on hydrogen, on green hydrogen, on all these sorts of, of electricity that will be uh, uh, very important for developing countries particularly those who have a lot of natural resources uh, uh, available. Lastly, we need to uh, work on the overall environment, which is uh, the, 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 the situation of utilities and of takers. Because if you want to have a proper generation, you need to ensure that the demand is as solid as possible 
and that demand is often articulated through the utilities. So having healthy utilities allow investors to come and invest in renewable and therefore to have off-takers who are healthier. And the healthier these off-takers are, the cheaper is the cost of electricity. Because if they are not healthy, you need to have guarantees to ensure that there is a sanctity of contract and this guarantee increase on the cost. So we have all the chain, and, the, and I just want to illustrate the complementarity between what you can do on mobilizing uh, 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 capital from the private sector and the, all the policy work that is done and the convening power that IAE has. And we promise ourselves to this to be the beginning of a process where we will be looking at binding constraints in that space and work together to address them. So if you allow me, I will uh, ask uh, the team, the great team that uh, have been doing a fantastic uh, 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 work, uh, Tim and uh, Susan, to uh, to give you uh, 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 some elements of uh, of the report that uh, is embargoed until tomorrow, so that you will have an opportunity to read fully when we are releasing it uh, tomorrow. So I will turn to uh, to uh, to Tim and to to start the presentation. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Managing Director. And I, we just have a couple of slides uh, which illustrate, uh, I think, some of the points already made by the Executive Director and, and the Managing Director. And the first one is just to highlight that pickup in clean energy spending in, in recent years. And that was highlighted very much by, um, by Dr. Roll, Dr. Birol. That's partly a story about costs. It's partly a story about policies and, and the way that energy security worries through the global energy crisis have reinforced the attraction of, of clean energy uh, technologies alongside their environmental benefits. And it's also, from our perspective, a, a question of industrial strategy, as companies and countries are, are looking for footholds in the, in the new emerging clean energy uh, economy. Um, but as was highlighted, when you start breaking this trend down, you can see that the picture becomes a lot more nuanced. First of all, to highlight that a big part of that has come from advanced economies, particularly the US um, and uh, the European Union. And then if you subtract China as well, China, a big clean energy powerhouse, and then you get to the situation that uh, Dr. Barol mentioned, that the amount of spending, the amount of investment going into clean energy technologies from emerging and developing countries outside China has remained relatively flat at, at just around or above uh, $250 billion each year. So there are positive signs within that. Solar in India is an exceptionally good example, and, and there are others. Um, but the fact remains that, that other emerging and developing economies, that's roughly two thirds of the global population, but that's only 15% of the amount of money going into a range of clean energy technologies. And if you ask the question, well, what's preventing capital from flowing into those kinds of projects? Um, there is no single or simple answer to that question. Each project has its own uh, distinctive profile and it faces some distinctive elements. So mature clean technologies have strong underlying um, economics, but they do face headwinds of different sorts. Some of them are, are sort of macro in nature and an environment of rising borrow borrowing costs um, is, is, is certainly a part of that broader picture. And, but I think some of the elements highlighted by the managing director are, are particularly pertinent in here. Um, a, a lack of data to assess risk, I think, is a very important consideration. And there are also very sort of sector and project specific um, issues that we need to have in mind. And I think uh, another very good example uh, that Mr. Diop mentioned is the creditworthiness of uh, off takers. So if you can't be sure that you're going to get paid for the output of your renewable project, that is, of course, a huge risk factor that you need to consider. Uh, when you're considering, uh, uh, when you're putting together a, a, an investment proposal. And there are good examples about how that's been handled. In the end, you have to have healthy utilities. But in, for instance, in India, uh, you had the Solar Energy Corporation of India that was set up as a very credit worthy, worthy counterpart for some of those renewable projects. And that's helped a lot of projects in the solar sector uh, go ahead in India. And others have sort of looked at that example. I think Cambodia is a good example. Um, where they had a similarly robust off-taker, but also looked after issues like um, land acquisition and, and uh, access to uh, the grid for projects. And that, of course, helps 
uh, projects coming through. But I think we need to have in mind that the weakness of grid infrastructure in, in many uh, emerging developing economies, that is a big constraint uh, on, on, on new clean uh, power investments. And so the risks, they vary from project to project, and we shouldn't only totally talk about the electricity sector. We need to focus also on the demand sectors, on clean fuels and everything else. Um, but a common denominator of that environment is that the cost of capital for um, a, a, a typical clean energy project in an emerging and developing economy can be two or three times higher than in uh, advanced economies or uh, in China. And of course, that will need to change if we're going to generate the sorts of increases that you're looking at on the screen and that would be required to meet those sustainable development goals and, uh, and, and climate goals. Um, but one element that I think is important to have in mind here, we've talked about access to electricity, um, access to clean cooking fuels is another extremely important issue uh, for sustainable development. Um, but to provide universal access to electricity and clean cooking fuels by 2030 would take just under 2% of that total. So that needs to be 45 billion um, uh, dollars. That's, that's the sort of sum that we need to be considering within that much larger um, envelope of, of financing that would, that would be needed in order to secure universal access. Um, and the, we've also done some detailed work by region, and you can see the sort of regional breakdown that we have here uh, for, for that spending, and there's a lot more uh, in, in the report. Um, but the title of this work is about scaling up private sector financing for um, clean energy in emerging developing economies. And I just wanted to say a couple of words on why that focus on, on private. Um, when we focus on private sector financing, we need to be clear, everything needs to scale up if we're going to achieve these um, sustainable development and, and climate goals. Public, private, domestic, international, uh, concessional, non-concessional. So it's very important to have in mind that no one source uh, will be able to do it alone. But that's roughly the financing picture that we see today uh, for clean energy investment in uh, emerging developing economies uh, for reasons that we can all understand that sources of public finance are constrained, particularly at a time when uh, many countries are facing severe fiscal constraints, high debt burdens uh, amongst the emerging developing economies themselves. Um, we need to see uh, increases in international commitments to help, uh, um, but the largest share the largest increase uh, comes from that, uh, that, that private uh, financing uh, side. And I think um, at this point, I would pass it across uh, to Susan to talk about how you can best deploy those public resources also to leverage uh, the much larger amounts of, of private capital that would be required. Okay, thank you, Tim, and thank you all. It has really been a pleasure working with the IEA uh, and their wonderful team. So to pick up, um, we need to scale up all types of financing, but particularly private sector financing. So I'll do the math for you on this chart. Currently, if we exclude China, we've got about $135 billion a year in private finance going to emerging economies for the clean energy transition. That's got to scale to 1.1 trillion. So we've got to increase nearly 10x what we're sending out to the emerging world. Now, how are we going to do that? So as you heard from Mokhtar, there are two pillars of what needs to happen. First is to um, create the financial instruments and platforms that will enable institutional investors and others to come in at scale. And secondly, we need to expand the pipeline of investable, bankable energy projects in emerging economies. So to do those things, we need four actions. First, we need to uh, radically scale up concessional blended finance for private investment. This report estimates that each year we're going to need $80 billion to $100 billion in concessional blended finance to attract the private investment needed. Now, I want to be very clear. Not every clean energy project in emerging economies needs blended finance. There are many solar PV projects or onshore wind projects that are commercially viable without any subsidies. But blended finance is needed, for instance, in new technologies that haven't scaled yet. So the costs are still very high and there's uncertainty, uncertainty about outcomes. So that would include, for instance, battery storage, uh, low emission hydrogen, 
or renewable fuel desalination today. In addition, we typically need blended finance in frontier markets that have high levels of macroeconomic or political risk associated with, with them. And that can also include the foreign currency risk that comes when you're investing in what is a local currency business bringing your hard currency. So when we look at it all together though, this is a good investment for the donor countries. In our experience, every single dollar of blended finance brings between $7 and $10 of private sector investment. So this is a, this is a high leverage uh, opportunity as opposed to giving a dollar of grant through a government where a dollar of grant is just a dollar of investment. The second thing we need, as Mokhtar mentioned, are new financing instruments and platforms that can attract institutional money at scale. Examples that you're well aware of are green bonds, blue bonds, sustainability linked bonds. There are voluntary carbon markets uh, that have the potential to raise capital, not only from investors, but also large corporations, provided that they're accompanied by credible plans to reduce their own carbon emissions by those corporations. However, all these things need a lot of work on standards, on credible monitoring and reporting, and on independent verification processes. There's a big risk of greenwashing and the world frankly doesn't have afford to have time to have these sort of quasi greenwashed instruments. Now, in addition, uh, are what we call platforms and securitization. These are critical because as Mokhtar mentioned, when you have a large uh, global investor, they can't invest in small projects. So platforms are a way of taking money in and investing up front. So IFC, for instance, along with Amundi, uh, launched the MCPP One Planet Fund. So it takes institutional money up front, and then we deploy it to a, a specific, uh, specified climate projects in developing countries like renewable energy. There's also securitization, which would work the other way around, where you take a bundle of climate-related investments, uh, perhaps from multiple MDBs at once, and you bundle them together into a security. This provides risk diversification, and sometimes blended finance is used to juice the returns of that to get it to investment grade, so you can then attract a whole set of institutional investors. So all these things need to be developed uh, and very quickly. Third, we do need to develop local capital markets in developing economies. And this is to scale domestic investment and enable local currency hedging. So by bolstering domestic bond and equity markets and swaps and derivative markets, we create an environment where energy projects can thrive. We also create an environment where we can allow domestic companies and domestic investors to finance projects, and we can enable either the local companies or foreign investors to hedge foreign currency risk. Finally, we need to dramatically scale the pipeline of investable projects. So when we talk to institutional investors, the problem is not a lack of money in the world. There's two and a half trillion dollars of money earmarked in ESG funds. So that's from investors who want to put their money to good use, but very, very little of that actually flows to emerging markets. So there's a lot that needs to be done to actually create the right policy environment to enable the private sector and enable foreign participation. First, governments need to establish their own credible medium and long-term clean energy transition plan. Investors need to know where a country's headed and that it's not a one-off opportunity. Second, there are a whole range of policy and regulatory actions that need to be taken that will differ by countries, but these may include um, reforming fossil fuel subsidies, uh, changing lengthy processes for licensing, uh, improving land rights use and, and usage, and, and removing restrictions on private or foreign ownership. Third, as Mokhtar mentioned, governments need to get their power sector um, in order. This includes uh, uh, making the off-taker or the public state-owned utilities um, credit worthy, and here, public-private uh, partnerships come in to play a big role. This is another area where IFC works with governments to help them structure and figure out how will they transform their energy sec sector to allow private investment in a sustainable way. Uh, 
And then finally, governments need to set the regulatory framework to allow the green and sustainable financial instruments we talked about to thrive. So to sum up, uh, the challenge is great. Uh, time is very short, but together we can build a more sustainable future. And with that, we would like to open it to questions from all of you. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. So we now have a bit of time to take questions from journalists. Um, for journalists in the room, do please raise your hands. Um, and journalists joining us virtually, please, please use the Q&A function in the Zoom. Uh, we do encourage you to state your name and news organization when placing your question. Uh, and one final point, we are in Paris. I know there are quite a few Francophone journalists joining us in person and remotely. If you prefer to put your question in French, that's absolutely fine. Um, uh, although I think most of our speakers will probably reply in English, uh, but we can see how it goes. Um, but just if that's uh, if that works better for anyone. Um, so we'll maybe try to do a few questions at a time. Um, uh, so we have uh, two people here, Matt and uh, another colleague. Oh, sorry. Sharon. Oh, okay, great. Um, Sharon, would you like to go first, and then and then or, and then Matt? Yeah. Well, thank you for your presentation. I'm Sharon Majbot. I work for Les Echo. Uh, I had one specific question on. Um, uh, we've seen um, a lot of European country plan planning to produce uh, hydrogen uh, in uh, emerging market. Uh, to what extent this could um, uh, accelerate uh, investment uh, and to what extent this could benefit to uh, emerging market. I mean, uh, in some project, in, in most of the project, uh, it is aimed and it is built to export the energy that is produced integrally. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. And, and Matt, if you could get your question as well. Matt Dalton with the Wall Street Journal. Um, you mentioned that there is the need for 80 to 100 billion annually in concessional finance. So how much is the world doing right now? Um, and what can the IFC do in particular to, to increase that number? Thank you, Matt. Um, and then uh, I think there's one question from the Zoom we'll do, and we'll take those three, uh, one after the other. Um, so um, uh, it's from Nuran Erkel from Anadolu Agency uh, in Turkey. And she asks, what are the biggest challenges in your view for clean energy investment and financing uh, in emerging and developing economies? Uh, and looking ahead, could this be a priority agenda uh, for COP28? Um, so in summary, we have the, the hydrogen um, in emerging uh, and developing economies and the export question from Sharon, um, Matt's question, on concessional finance and, and what IFC can do, and then uh, a question on on the whether this could be a priority for COP twenty eight. Um, Dr. Bill, would you like to to start us off? Uh, maybe if uh, Magda, you agree, I start with one and three, and you you, you can go the, whatever you want. So I will not answer the IFC question. <laughs> I will leave it to you. So <laughs> no, 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 no. Thank you very much. So. Um, now you are right. Many European countries uh, want to, uh, in order to address the uh, energy security and uh, climate challenges, many European countries uh, are uh, making agreements with the, especially African uh, countries to import their uh, hydrogen to their energy mix. Uh, in my view, uh, it is uh, important to see that the Today, uh, Europe needs additional energy, but uh, Africa needs even more energy than uh, Europe for the energy uh, mix. I hope that those projects uh, would uh, be designed in a way that it would uh, first uh, help the uh, addressing energy and climate challenges of the uh, very African country. Second, it would provide a handsome uh, export revenues to those countries, and thirdly, it would be a, a, a good uh, deal for the European countries in this priority order, uh, I would put it. For the third question, uh, for the COP28 and clean energy investments, uh, I very much hope uh, that the COP28 uh, would give a strong boost uh, to uh, clean energy investment emerging and developing countries. 
one very issue you all know that the 100 billion uh, story and we expect this 100 billion will be reached but within the 100 billion only 30 billion goes to clean energy the other ones go to agriculture and adaptation and others out of this 130 billion is for uh, energy and our analysis show that to reach our energy and climate uh, goals in these countries this 30 uh, 30 billion and needs to be multiplied by three and we hope that the advanced economies uh, are there in order to commit themselves to uh, to uh, increase this uh, amount by a factor of uh, three. In my view, this will be uh, one of the outcomes I will watch closely whether or not COP28 will be a successful one or, or, or not. Over to you. Thank you, Mashwati. Yeah. Uh, I do think that uh, uh, quite a few things needs to be happening in, for, for hydrogen. First, uh, as I indicated, uh, we need to attract more investment for cutting the, the, the cost of, of, uh, of uh, hydrogen. From what I learned from my colleague from IEA, is that electrolyzer costs are, are roughly 30% of the price, and 70% is coming from energy when you want to produce hydrogen. So the cost of energy will drive a lot uh, the, the, the possibility of producing hydrogen. We talk a lot about electrolyzers, that's part of the capital cost, but, uh, not, uh, but you know there are some important factors, which is the cost of electricity. And when you want to have green hydrogen, you need to have to continue investing heavily in renewable energy so that you can you can produce cheaper electricity to be able to do that. But as we're talking about hydrogen also, I had yesterday a good conversation around water. Water will be also an important issue to be looked at when you want to ensure that this energy, this form of energy as also is sustainable. Uh, we know that a lot of these countries which have also access to green energy are water scarce. So we have a whole dynamic that is driven by energy policy and what energy can do in a country to be able to move the, the, the needle on, 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 on climate change agenda. Practically, uh, uh, when there is local demand for green hydrogen, it makes it even easier to develop. And we have a good example for us with OCP. OCP is Office Sherifian de Phosphate, which is one of the largest uh, uh, fertilizer producers in the world, uh, which is uh, a client of IFC. And we are helping them to produce urea with uh, green hydrogen. As you know, Morocco has been investing heavily in CSP, uh, concentrated solar power and other form of power on the solar energy. And that is uh, they will be using that basis to be able to produce green hydrogen and therefore link it to the producer production of fertilizer. And that's a good uh, 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 illustration of what it, uh, of the importance of, of energy and electricity in, 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 in all production uh, sectors uh, uh, which are mentioned. So today, we can, we, we can posit that if we invest heavily in renewable energy, we can help having a solution to the food crisis that we're having right now, to have food security and to have sustainable fertilizers, which is something that when people are talking about electricity and energy, they don't often uh, refer, to, uh, refer to. I will ask... Uh, 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 Susan, to tell you more about the numbers, but what you can do more to mobilize is a little bit uh, uh, more of what we are currently doing and need to have new uh, uh, avenues. New avenues is will be very much linked to the project preparation and the number of bankable projects. What we would like to do, we are working on a, on a concept which is called the warehousing, whereby we will be having a, a, a project that has been prepared, put it on, put it in that warehouse and after offload it to the market uh, uh, very quickly. So, but to do that, you need to be able to generate project at scale. You need, and uh, for me, we're talking a lot about uh, mobilization money, but not enough about generation of project. And that generation of project is linked to a lot of the policy issues that have been highlighted, uh, the sustainability of the sector, but also a clear vision of what the country wants to do in the energy sector. If there is no visibility, you cannot have this very large project that allows you to uh, mobilize more resources, to securitize them, to do all the things that we have mentioned. Secondly, we need more, more, uh, more uh, 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 blended finance and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, grant money to be able to de-risk investment in new technologies. Uh, we need, uh, and that's what will be, make them 
much more, much, much more expensive. Secondly, we need to work on the taxonomy, uh, the green taxonomy on, on, in countries to deepen the capital market and be able to mobilize more, more, more resources on, on, on it. Third, we need to, to continue helping the individual companies to have a green transition. One of the things that we are doing a lot is that companies which are working in hard to abate sector have a, have a challenge. They want to reduce emissions, but they cannot because they don't have a plan. So currently we are working with a, a, a large companies in sectors like aluminum and others to help them have a trajectory which helps them to, to accelerate their green transition. So at the utility level, at the capital market level, but at the individual firm level, and looking particularly at how to abate sectors. Let me just add, so today there's about $1 billion that goes each year into concessional finance for emerging markets in the clean energy. So we're talking about an 80 to 100 fold uh, increase. What are we doing? Well, we're, as Mokhtar said, we're working a lot to mobilize private investors through various means like securitization, like upfront flat forms, co-investments. Another thing we're doing uh, that Mokhtar mentioned in the very beginning of his um, points is looking hard at what risk is out there. So we definitely have a view that a lot of private investors are misjudging the true risk of investing in emerging economies. Uh, one way to solve that um, is to make public the data of GEMS, this consortium of DFIs, where we have uh, 20 years of returns on investment projects. But another thing we're doing is looking at our own experience over time. So I'll give you an example uh, from blended finance for micro and small businesses um, at, that we call the base of the pyramid program. When we started, we started giving pooled first loss guarantees of 40% on these portfolios of loans to SMEs. Well, over time, we found that losses weren't very high. So now that's been reduced to 25 to 30%. So as we get more experience, we see how we can minimize uh, the amount of concessional finance needed in the form of guarantees and other instruments to attract private capital. Um, and so this experience by IFC and other DFIs, I think will be critical in making sure that we're really getting the most out of every dollar of donor funding that we have. Maybe add also on the on, the, on something that we've been talking a lot about is, is on the demand side. Uh, we talked about the general utilities, but you have a, a lot of sectors which are becoming more electrified. One of them is EV. Yeah, EV is not anymore uh, an, uh, a no more an issue of more advanced economy. It's becoming part more and more of a project which are financed in the in the uh, uh, developed count, uh, developing countries, and to the even to the lower level of transportation, for instance, is not only SUV or, or cars, but for instance, we are currently financing in India three wheelers, which are EV vehicles for the last two miles. So reconciling the social dimension of what we are doing with, uh, with electricity uh, production is something very important uh, because this is a, a, a part of the overall conversation of SDG 7. Thank you very much for those answers. I think we've got, just got time for one or two more questions before we wrap up. Are there any more in the room? Yes, uh, please go ahead. Yes. Sorry, could you press it again? I, I, my fault, I pressed my, my button again. Could you, would you mind pressing the microphone button one more time? I think it's okay. Anne Chevial from the, from the Figaro. Um, a question a little different. Um, many countries, uh, many countries in, develop, in developing countries have um, uh, many resources in uh, hydrocarbon, and um, of course, it uh, they ask uh, to leave this resource, and uh, they have um, sorry, it's uh, difficult to ask them to leave this resource uh, in the ground. So, what do how do you respond to that? What is your what is a good strategy for this country? In fact, we are preparing a report for COP28 on this very issue because COP28 takes place in uh, one of the countries where uh, there's a lot of hydrocarbon resources and our chief economist, uh, uh, Tim Good is in charge of this. Tim, would you like to share some of the thoughts on that, please? So one of the points that we have made very regularly in our own investment analysis and also in the World Energy Outlook is that we need to be very focused on building up the new clean energy economy. And that means all of the issues that we've discussed today and that the amount that you will then need in terms of fossil fuel investment um, will depend on the success you have in meeting 
the demand for energy services in a sustainable way. And so the more rapidly we are able to achieve the sorts of things that we've talked today, you know, that will then depend on, that will then shape the, the, the residual requirement for investment in oil uh, and gas in, in particular. Um, and many of you will be familiar with some of the conclusions that we reached when we looked at a, a 1.5 degree stabilization in, in, in global average temperatures and the dramatic nature of the, uh, of the implications that it has for fossil fuel demand. And that said, uh, we also recognize that um, developing emerging economies, they have a variety of energy needs, not just in the power sector where technologies are already mature, um, but I think it was also already mentioned by the managing director. And um, there's a big need also for expansion of manufacturing. All of the energy intensive goods that go into building up the infrastructure of, of a modern state, the cement, the steel, and the scale of urbanization in many countries, uh, particularly um, in, in Africa over the coming decades, um, does mean a quite significant increase um, in, in, in the requirement for those energy intensive goods. And in that sense, um, clean fuels, but also uh, natural gas um, uh, has, a, has a role to play there. And so we are sensitive to the different contours of that discussion. Um, but let's not imagine that you know, the situation that we're in today, particularly after the global energy crisis, suddenly creates a, 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 an opening for very large, long-term new fossil fuel projects. I think the, the indications from the market are that there are risks associated with those and they need to be borne in mind by established producers, but also by emerging producers as well. Thank you very much, uh, Tim. I think, so we have just two more questions in the Zoom, um, and, and I think that will be the, the last ones we have time for. One from Nico Beckett uh, from Climate Table. Uh, you mentioned a variety of reforms in developing and emerging countries that are needed to attract private investments. How long will it take to implement these reforms? Do we have this time in the fight against the climate crisis? And then one from Risha Sharma uh, from the Economic Times in India, um, who starts with a, a kind of a, a statement, an assertion, um, uh, trade protectionism measures by developed world, um, I guess, developed world countries in new green energy technologies poses a threat to countries which have abundant natural sources uh, of renewables. Uh, does that therefore hamper climate mitigation efforts? Um, so there's the question on the reforms uh, and then a question on, uh, you know, I guess the, the, the new industrial plans in, in various economies around the world um, and how that uh, hurts or hampers um, mitigation efforts. Um, I don't know if uh, Mr. Diop, you'd, you'd like to speak about the reforms, perhaps? I mean, reforms are very specific to countries because the reform are based on the political economy and the social contract that we have in the society. Therefore, uh, it's uh, difficult to say the pace at uh, the reform. And secondly, the initial conditions are very different. There are some countries who have already made a certain type of reform in a certain area, I haven't made it reform in certain other areas. So they will have a different challenge a different challenge. And I can illustrate uh, 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 that. Some countries, for instance, have no have uh, no problem on the ownership of, of, uh, of assets, and they are very comfortable to have ownership of assets, uh, which depend, which will come from every part of the world. Other countries have, have some restriction on, on this. Some countries have a, a clear policy on, on access, or uh, uh, some countries have reached already 100% uh, access and some countries are at 17% access. So depending on this condition, you have a different set of reform and different set of questions. And the, if you look at the, the, the point that Tim made in his presentation by emphasizing that expenditure and uh, we are needed both on the public and private side and the DFI side, and that's what it illustrates. It illustrates the diversity of reform, the diversity of need depending on the nature of the country, the state of development, and the, and the particular story. So I cannot give a generic uh, answer on, on the pace, but what I can tell you is that there is urgency, and there is a sense of emergency, and everybody is pushing. And that emergency has been reflected in the world by using instruments like the JetP, which was a, 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 a way to, to, to pull resources from the international community to look at the, uh, the priority of some countries. You have the NDCs, which are the, the, uh, what the, the country nationally determined as a way forward. And these NDCs 
a big part of the NDCs are looking at the energy sector as being a way, and they articulate what is the path for them to be able to, to, to reach that. Uh, lastly, uh, 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 Fatih has been really a leader in, in bringing inclusion in the, around the table where the decisions are made of more and more developing countries, most of the emerging countries, so that the world can understand the particular constraints and complexities that some of the low-income countries are facing in this transition. And I think that will be part of, of, of the conversation. We understand also, to understand the question coming from India, that there are some, some efforts that are made from some uh, 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 emerging economies to be part of the supply chain of uh, manufacturing linked to climate change and uh, uh, renewable electricity. I know, for instance, that India, to talk about India, has what they call the DLI, which are the PLI, the performance link uh, indicator, where, whereby if a company meets a certain number of criteria, there are incentives which are put by the Indian government to support the development of this particular uh, manufacturing sector. <laughs> they have it, uh, I know, in battery sectors. They are looking at electrolyzers. They are looking at all this. So this is good news. It means that we will have a geographically diversified source of, uh, of production that will be uh, available to, to countries. And IFC is working with each of the countries to be able to look at the opportunity that would be allowing us to increase uh, production and to come and to come back to the point that was made earlier by Tim, we need to there not a silver bullet. It will be a lot of coordinated action on various sectors that will allow us to really make the strides that we would like to make. If I may add two points here, Jetro, may I? Okay, uh, thank you. So uh, I completely agree with uh, Magda in terms of reforms. The countries, the host countries, the developing countries have to make reforms for the investment framework, how they can attract the capital, but also building the, uh, the capital markets, uh, sound capital markets at home. But there is other part of the equation is the reform is the international financial architecture. And I think this is a very urgent reform and I am thankful to President Macron to call this uh, meeting uh, the day after tomorrow and, uh, and uh, uh, Thursday in order to uh, make sure that there is a move to change the international financial architecture. As it stands now, it doesn't work. We will see after this uh, meeting and the uh, other uh, uh, steps taken by the international community, whether it will work, whether it will be helpful to address the climate crisis, debt crisis and other uh, crises. So we need reforms uh, both ways. For the trade issues, uh, Yes, uh, there are some uh, countries from the United States, the Inflation Reduction Act, to, as Magda mentioned, India, PLI, the production link incentives uh, in uh, Europe. Uh, we have Japan, Indonesia are uh, coming. We hope that uh, these uh, policies, they are mainly uh, industrial policies uh, linked with the trade policies, are designed in a way that they do not hamper the uh, penetration of clean energy technologies, but uh, provides the international cooperation among the countries so that the cost comes down and the penetration of clean energy technologies uh, go higher. So uh, trade policies are good uh, as long as they give a boost to clean energy technology de deployment around the world. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Birrell and uh, Mr. Diop for those uh, final answers. Um, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today. Um, if any journalists do have questions that didn't get answered during the Q&A that you'd like to follow up on, we invite you to reach out to our press office and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. A reminder that all of the material for today is embargoed until 6 a.m. tomorrow morning, Wednesday, the 21st of June. Um, thank you very much to all of our speakers and thank you very much to you journalists uh, for attending here in person and via Zoom. Thank you and goodbye.